Hey guys, welcome back to another GCSE revision lesson. Now guys, within this lesson, I want to offer you the definitive guide on how to pass and to do really well in all five questions of your language paper two exams, which are just around the corner. Guys, within this lesson, not only do I want to show you what examiner's expectations are of you when you're answering all five questions, okay, in both section A and section B, but guys, I want to also highlight to you how you can do well in every single question, as long as, number one, you manage your timings really well, so you don't run out of time for the really important question four and question five, but also, and most importantly, how to answer the question in a way that hits all your assessment objectives, okay, this is what examiners want and what they're looking for as they're marking your scripts. And of course, guys, even how to write evaluatively, particularly for those two comparison questions that you have to tackle in paper two. Now, guys, remember that when it comes to language paper two, you always get two inserts, okay? So source A is always the modern text and then source B is the Victorian text. How should you approach it? Guys, I'm gonna cut straight to the chase. I'm not gonna waffle. Let's get into it with question number one. Now guys, remember that question number one is really simple and straightforward. It's worth four marks. You're always asked to look at source A, okay? Often it's the modern source. In fact, all past paper questions thus far ask you to just look at the modern source and then find four statements that are true. However, instead of writing anything, this is a multiple choice question. What that means is, all you simply need to do is, the question is gonna give you specific line numbers, okay? It's usually the first paragraph. Look at the correct lines, okay? So make sure you're picking the right lines when you're finding the answer for this question. And the only other way to go wrong is to spend too long on this question, okay? So guys, remember that for this question, would test your AO1, your ability to interpret explicit and implicit information, in other words, are you able to just understand what the question is asking of you? And when you're reading the source, are you able to pick out the relevant information? For this question, don't stress out, okay? Spend a max of five minutes on this question as it's worth just four marks, okay? That's question number one. And examiners just want to see you're able to pick out the right information from the right line numbers, pick the four statements that are true, move on. Then question number two. This is your first comparison question. What do you need to pay attention to with this question, but also guys, pay attention and focus on how this question is gonna be very distinct from question number four. When I get eventually around to talking about question number four, remember that you cannot recycle the same points in question two as number four. This is what question number two, your first comparison question for both sources tests. Firstly, the question will ask you to either compare similarities or differences um, which are thematically linked in both texts. In other words, um, if we think about past paper questions, right? One of the past paper questions, I believe it was the 2022 exam, it was to do with the general theme of camping, okay? And this is to do with how, so question two was asking, how are the campsites similar or different? Um, one of the other papers that comes to mind was actually what I was doing with my Sunday masterclass for language paper two. We looked at the 2019 paper and the theme that was in both papers, because remember that both extracts you're given, there's always a theme that ties them together. This was to do with people on boats, okay? Source A, it was a modern text, and this was a smaller boat. Source B was a larger ship, okay? So, firstly, the question, okay, so question two will say, pay attention to the theme. There's a general overarching theme that ties both texts together. And then, either talk about similarities or differences, okay? So make sure you pay attention to what that's asking of you, okay? Is it a similarity or is it a difference? Now, question two, which is your first comparison question, actually tests your AO1. In other words, are you able to both interpret explicit and implicit information, for example, in other words, even, are you able to interpret what the texts are saying correctly, but also, are you able to do synthesis, to synthesize evidence from different texts. In other words, are you able to just simply compare the text? And this is how you do so, okay? So that you're getting your AO1 marks for question number two. Firstly, how to do so is decide, am I talking about similarities or differences for my exam question? Thus, I need to make sure when I'm using evaluative language showing either similarities or differences, I either, if I'm talking about differences, I start my answer by saying the following. While source A demonstrates or conveys blah, 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 source B, however, shows blah, blah, blah. This is if I'm talking about differences. However, 
if the question that you get in your actual exam asks you to talk about similarities, well, the evaluative language you use is both source A and source B demonstrate blah, 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 okay? And you also need to make sure in your paragraphs you are integrating both texts. Do not allocate one paragraph for source A and one paragraph for source B and say, oh, they're both in the same essay, therefore I'm comparing. That's not comparing, you're talking about them in parallel, okay? Comparison means you have to integrate both sources. And this is how you do so, okay? So remember to use a peel paragraph structure. That's what I tend to use. I think peel paragraphs literally uh, include and encompass everything that examiners are looking for. So point, evidence, explanation, link. But how to integrate both sources, you do it in this way in a peel paragraph. In your opening point, talk about source A and source B. Are they similar? Are they different, okay? And then in your evidence, then add evidence from source A and source B. In your explanation, say and evaluate what does this show us about the general themes I'm supposed to be looking at, okay? In your explanation for question number two, you do not need to talk about techniques. Simply just talk about how are these two texts similar or different and then finish off by linking back to source A and B. Ideally, given this question is worth eight marks, okay, make sure you spend 10 minutes on this question. Most ideal would be, if you can, okay, to improve your writing speed so that you can allocate five minutes to two comparative paragraphs. However, if that's a challenge, stick to one chunky peel paragraph and don't worry about mentioning techniques. Techniques come in later on. That's your approach for question number two. And of course, make sure you're always paying attention to what your examiners are looking for in this question, which is A01. Let's move on to question number three. Question three should actually, at this stage, guys, feel like home because you've actually now, at this stage, hopefully, you are now familiar with language paper one. Question three in paper two tests exactly the same skills as question two of paper one. In other words, you were asked to look at one particular source, either source A or source B, either the modern one or the Victorian one, and look at specific line numbers and talk about how the writers use language to convey something. So you're only talking about one source. And this is how to approach this question and to do really well on this question. For this question, which is worth 12 marks, um, aim to write at least three pill paragraphs in around 13 minutes. As it's the same skills as question two of paper one, you need to simply make sure you are demonstrating an awareness of subject terminology because this is testing your AO2 skills. Are you familiar with different subject terminology relating to language? Alliteration, simile, sibilance, metaphors, uh, personification, hyperbole, all of that stuff. Guys, um, refer to my language and structure techniques for paper two video. If you're still unclear and you're still fuzzy, on what does language mean and what does structure mean so that going into your exams, you are familiar with the different terminologies, okay? Now, for this question, as I said, not only do you need to talk about language, but also guys within your peel paragraphs aim to write at least two minimum, if not three, try to also zoom in on one word and then do some word level analysis, make it relevant to the question. That's question number three for language paper two. It should feel like home because you're not comparing two sources. You're just looking at one source and then talking about language techniques and doing some word level analysis, zooming in, okay? Now, let's talk about Question number four, okay? This is your second comparative question. Now guys, as I said, do not recycle the same points in question two, which generally tell, uh, gives you a general question relating to similarities or differences on some thematic element that runs in both sources. That's not the same question as question number four. Question four, guys, always asks you to talk about the writer's viewpoints and perspectives. In other words, how do the writers personally convey either the similar experiences or the different experiences? Do they have similar purposes when writing these um, extracts or they have different um, purposes? You either look at similarities or differences, but this is now when you're thinking about the writers themselves, the authors of the two texts. Very different skills are tested in question two, where you've got to synthesize the evidence and the information to question four. So guys, do not make the mistake in your exams of saying, when I go in, I literally, I'm just gonna say the same thing for question two as four, because both of them are basically talking about either similarities or differences. You're not going to be getting decent marks for question four if you do that, okay? Because it's asking you to focus on something different. In other words, guys, make sure you don't talk about the same points as question two. This question tests your AO3, okay? 
are you able to effectively compare the writer's ideas? In other words, guys, this is what you talk about for question number four. When you're thinking about the writer's viewpoints and perspectives, think about number one, maybe allocate one paragraph, one comparison paragraph for both sources to what do the writers think in both source A and source B. Pay attention to either is it a similarity you're being asked to look for or a difference. That's one paragraph you can talk about. And remember, obviously, guys, in terms of your structure, it's again a comparative peel paragraph, point for both, evidence for both, explanation for both, and link for both. However, another thing you can think about when you're considering writers' viewpoints and perspectives is what could the writer's purpose be? For instance, have the writers written uh, the text, say for example, if we go back to the camping text, is the purpose to encourage you to go camping, right? Is the purpose to discourage you even, right? Because that could be another purpose from doing something. Consider the writer's purpose, then use one paragraph to talk about that and compare both sources, okay? Another thing you can consider when you're talking about writer's viewpoints and perspectives is what is the writer's tone? Is it sarcastic? Is it even sardonic? You know, like it's quite scathing in its criticism or is the writer's tone very joyful, very optimistic, okay? Think about that when you're considering both sources and when you're writing about the writer's viewpoints and perspectives for this question. Another thing you can think about with writer's viewpoints and perspectives is what are they saying indirectly but hiding? What's maybe the hidden meaning that is being conveyed in both source A and source B? That's a little bit harder to spot, but if you're able to, if you're able to think about the connotations, what's just beneath the surface and what's just beneath the surface for both source A and source B, that's really powerful, okay? And as I said, guys, the question will either say focus on a similarity or a difference, meaning not only are you using this type of evaluative language, while well, source A does this, source B does this for difference, or both source A and source B do this, blah, 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 blah. Not only are you doing that, but also guys, you're using a pill paragraph structure, combining both sources in the same paragraph because you are comparing. But equally guys, in this question, you also need to think about the writer's methods, okay? One of the bullet points always asks you to think about the writer's methods, meaning, you need to talk about language and structure when you, um, when you are talking about the question, okay? Writers' viewpoints and perspectives, what um, tone are they talking about? What purpose are they conveying? All of that, then support it by considering your subject terminology. And as I said, guys, make sure you are doing so in order to hit your AO3 marks, which is what examiners are looking for, okay? So guys, I've literally put here, guys, you have to mention this stuff. And of course, you need to consider writers' viewpoints and perspectives, okay? I've literally written, hello, duh, because guys, please make sure you don't take the approach that some students take when they think they're being clever by saying, when I go into the exam, I'm literally gonna write word for word exactly what how I've answered question two, I'm gonna talk about it in question four. You are not answering the question in that case because question two asks you to look at totally different things to question number four. Let's now look at question number five, the fifth and final one. And actually, before I even move on, going back to question number four, as this question is worth 16 marks and you're literally, you know, um, juggling lots of things, okay, you're spinning lots of plates, for this question in terms of your timings, spend 17 minutes on this question and aim to write a minimum of two, if not, three comparison peel paragraphs. So you don't need an introduction or conclusion, just launch straight into the question. Now for question number five, okay? This is the final question worth half of the paper's overall marks, 40 marks, meaning you wanna spend a minimum of 45 to 50 minutes, spend the first 10 minutes of that chunk of time planning your response, thinking through your response. Now, question number five is significant because not only does it uh, is it gonna make or break your mark, but also guys, it tests your ability to write persuasively, to have an opinion on what is called topical issues. In other words, stuff that's just generally debated in society. Is education worth the paper it's printed on? Um, is social media and technology good or bad for us? Um, are parents too overprotective? Have an opinion on these different things. And guys, when it comes to question number five actually, um, Earlier on in the year, I actually did a question five series where literally I went through every single possible topic that could be tested in this question and gave you guys essay plans, okay? So if you've not seen those videos, I'm gonna link them in the description. Just literally click through and watch those videos, okay? So think about and have an opinion on topical issues, for example, climate change, 
animal cruelty, social media is it good or bad for us or even technology. There's different topical issues that you're going to be tested on for this question. So try to anticipate them. Okay. It's actually easy to do really well on this question as long as you're able to have an opinion and write persuasively. In other words, guys, for question five, not only do you need to demonstrate an opinion on a topical issue, but also guys, this question tests your ability to write persuasively, to show an awareness of also form, okay? Guys, for this question, you're either gonna be asked to write a letter, article, or speech. Make sure you know the difference between all three and demonstrate that you know the difference, okay? A letter, start off with, you know, the address of the person receiving that letter, the date, then your opening paragraph, your main argument, counter arguments, then end with your sincerely kind regards, which is my favorite because it's really easy to spell, your name and surname. That's a letter in terms of form. An article, on the other hand, start off with a headline, really nice, short and sweet, then your opening paragraph to introduce the issue and your perspective, then your first subheading to break up the text and make it easy for your reader's eyes to glide over the text, then your main points, counter arguments, and then you just have a closing paragraph. That's your article, and in terms of a speech, open your speech with addressing your audience, either ladies and gentlemen, if it's just a general audience, or fellow student, if it's to your peers, then in your speech, just have your opening discussion, your main body points, counter arguments, and then close your speech and thank your audience for listening. That's literally it with forms, okay? However, you also need to make sure you write in an entertaining way. What I mean by that is, if you're asked to write about, for example, climate change, and you argue that climate change is important, do not start your article, letter, or speech by saying, I am writing this letter too. I am writing this article too because guys, that is boring. You are not making it entertaining. So not only do you need to write persuasively, but you also need to write in a way that's entertaining and engaging for your reader, okay? Instead, what you need to do is add and weave in things like anecdotes, made up statistics, as well as examples, but also when you are writing, okay, your response, make sure you do so like a wordsmith, have a mouthpiece, okay? In other words, instead of starting with, I am writing this article too, maybe you can start with rule of three. Say for example, if we go back to social media, is it good for us, is it bad for us, right? And you argue, for instance, that social media is bad for us, right? So if you want to use rule of three, you can say, list out three different types of social media. Uh, TikTok, YouTube, WhatsApp, these are devices and social media platforms that are destroying our brains, right? Already that opening is far more engaging than, for example, I am writing this article to tell you why social media is so bad for us, okay? That's one way you can make your writing engaging and entertaining. Another way you can even open the rhetorical question, you can use really interesting use of sibilance, alliteration, all the stuff that you are already familiar with when it comes to language and structure, you now need to weave that into your writing. In other words, as I said, you have to be a wordsmith. You need to have that mouthpiece. You need to make your writing engaging. You need to make it entertaining. And you also need to make it persuasive. And of course, when you're making it persuasive, you show that, oh, it's not just my opinions. Actually, according to made up statistic, Cambridge University, 70% of social media users, let's say you're using that as your example, um, reported terrible mental health, right? That's what makes it persuasive. But of course, also guys, you need to also demonstrate in a debate and then when you're talking about topical issue, a counter argument. Why would people disagree with you, okay? It doesn't need to be perfectly balanced, but you need to show at least one counter argument and why people would disagree with you before you finish off by saying, actually, even if I've considered what naysayers would say, naysayers is a really good word to use, I still think I'm right, okay? This is where my opinion stands, okay? So that's really it when it comes to your definitive guide for passing language paper two. Guys, once you've finished watching this, I'd like to firstly recommend, especially for question five, watch my question five series of videos where I go over different topic areas and essay plans for those so that you can have an opinion on different topic uh, points. But also guys, now go off and try and find challenging texts, okay? Challenging extracts to use. Actually, one of the hacks I've mentioned in the past is if you can scour the net and find two extracts that are really old, okay? Challenging and then apply, you know, um, and, and even use the same format and framework in terms of, you know, finding question one, you know, um, things are, uh, issues that are true. Question two, comparative writing. Question three, looking for language. Question four, writer's viewpoints and perspective. Ask yourself these questions. And of course, with the topical issues, of, as I've said, literally just figure out what are the things that we t tend to hear about in society today. 
Can I have an opinion on them? Can I make up some statistics, some examples and some anecdotes? That's really it guys when it comes to how to prepare for this paper and thank you so much for listening.